Well, while she's getting that going, I will get started. A lot of people are coming in, so I appreciate that. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining us for this conversation. Uh, this is what I've dubbed as a good faith space, um, which I host every week, at least thus far, uh, every Wednesday at 7.30, uh, different topics with different people. Uh, this week, I wanted to focus on the role of government and how the government is supposed to be within our lives or not supposed to be within our lives. Um, but I have three wonderful people that graciously accepted my invite, um, Stephen Kent, Natalie, um, and uh, Gothics. Um, so I'll let them all introduce themselves first. Uh, Stephen, you wanna go first, introduce, introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Stephen Kent. I'm the host of Right Now with Stephen Kent on the Rightly Network. It's a new product of Al Jazeera to do sort of conservative and libertarian talk. Uh, I'm the co-host or host long time running of the Beltway Banthas Star Wars and Politics Analysis Podcast. So doing the politics of Star Wars. And I'm now, I guess, the author of a new book called How the Force Can Fix the World. So uh, author and TV commentator and uh, Star Wars fanatic, <laughs> as well as a, a civic libertarian. So that's me. Awesome. Uh, thank you for introducing yourself. Natalie, you want to introduce yourself? I didn't say your last name because I feel like I'm going to butcher it. So if you want to. <laughs> Nobody says my last name right. It's Dan Alition. Um, yeah. Go. I'm Natalie. Um, I work uh, as a contractor for the Mises Institute, and I have for 10 years now, actually. This is my 10th year at the Mises Institute as a contractor. Um, I also have worked with other people like Ron Paul and stuff over the years, and uh, that's basically my thing. Uh, but my main thing is I have uh, three wonderful children, and uh, I homeschool them all, and I've been doing that also for about 10 years. So I haven't slept for about 10 years. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Um, I'm a graphic artist so along with, uh, doing editing and booking and all kinds of fun things. So yeah, that's about me. Awesome. All right. Uh, thank you for introducing yourself and last but not least, Gothics, you want to introduce yourself? You are totally right. I was on the computer, uh, but I figured it out. Uh, hi everyone. My name is Gothics and I am a Twitch streamer, uh, turned commentator i guess not by choice totally by force uh and this was the result of cancel culture so now i just make think pieces and provide commentary and common sense in a world where nobody seems to have any of that anymore uh looking forward to participating in the chat okay great thank you for introducing yourself and i will introduce myself to people who aren't familiar with me uh, my name is adam coleman I am the author of a book called Black Victim, the Black Victor, which uh, basically is social commentary about uh, race in America, while also using my personal life story. That's kind of like it in a nutshell. Um, I'm also the founder of Wrong Speak Publishing. So if you ever get a chance, go to wrongspeak.net. You can read my many writings uh, along with other people who have contributed. So um, that's me, but I wanted to have uh, this particular conversation about the role of government, um, especially in a time like this where we have mandates that are being imposed, uh, not just in America, but, you know, I was just watching a video of what's happening throughout Europe and Belgium uh, and Netherl in the Netherlands, uh, in, in various parts of Europe where they're either starting to impose mandates for everybody or they are basically considering it. Um, and there are people, even in Europe, where they're very government friendly, are starting to realize that this, this way of government force is anti-liberty, basically. Um, you know, I've done a little bit of traveling. And I've met Europeans um, throughout my travels. And one of the things that was pretty consistent is that they have a general trust of government. And to see that there are people who are kind of waking up and understanding like maybe government is flawed or can be flawed. Maybe this blind trust in within government isn't a good idea. Um, and I'm just curious as to, you know, you guys who are liberty minded, what, I mean, this it sounds like a very, very general question. So this conversation could go any direction, but what exactly do you think 
is the role of government? Is the government supposed to ensure our safety to the extent yeah. of, of, you know, restricting our liberty? I have my opinion on that, but what do you guys think? Um, I'll, I'll go to Stephen first. What do you think? Well, uh, the government's role, as far as I'm concerned, just comes straight from the Declaration of Independence. It's to secure natural rights that supersede and precede the existence of the United States government in the first place. So our natural rights that are given to us by God, um, the United States and, and Congress after Congress after Congress and various Supreme Courts have a little pesky habit of inventing rights and then saying that they're going to hand it down to us when, in fact, the only role of this government is supposed to be to secure what is naturally ours. So that's kind of the, the heady answer. Um, you know, on the on the kind of more practical side of things, I, I think the role of government is to prevent a foreign invasion and to make sure that people are not being killed on the streets. Uh, and that's pretty much um, all I really care to see it do. I have some thoughts about the, the trust issue and whether or not, you know, trust in government is a good or a bad thing. But I suppose we can get to there as we as we go along. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's let's go to Natalie and we'll come back to that. Natalie, what? Where do you, where do you think about this? Well, I agree with Stefan in the sense that, yeah, the natural rights. I mean, it, the government only is supposed to protect, you know, life, liberty, and property, and um, those are in the Constitution. I mean, if you look at Article One, Section Eight, you will find like what eighteen on the list of what the government can and can't do, and um, it's a short list. So they should not be allowed to go beyond that. And what we're seeing with COVID is that they are going beyond that. And you're seeing that with judge rulings right now in several states. Um, Ohio just restricted uh, the federal contract mandate. So, I mean, you can see these judges are seeing that they're overstepping the constitution and they're not allowed to be doing that. And that's not the role of government. And I, I believe so many people in these last two years don't know what their actual rights are because people are caving to these mandates over and over again. And you're seeing that more and more. And you understand that because if you go to public schools, they really don't teach you your rights. You, I learned that outside of public school. But um, that, that, that's like the one thing I'm seeing right now is that, sorry, my screen went dark. Um, people don't know their rights and they don't know the role of government and they're just letting them have it all. So, and, and when we go beyond individual rights of life, liberty, and property, uh, you see regulations, you see welfare programs, you see trade restrictions and tax policies and all those things. And it leads to this COVID madness. And what we're really missing is a free market. And that's basically it. And the government is restricting all of that from us. And you see them overstepping every single day. And it's getting frustrating for me. But um, we're moving from freedom to serfdom. And that's one of our biggest things. And we have to get back to the Constitution. And that's not what we're seeing right now. Okay. Um, Gothics, what's your take? Yeah, I, I am totally in agreement with uh, both of the speakers. And I, I also think that right now the government is banking on the fact that a lot of people are uneducated about their own rights. And I think what they're doing is they're trying to condition a new generation of young people to also not understand what freedom is. Uh, and now we have this situation where a lot of people are seeking to the government for safety, for them to provide for them. And what they don't understand is if you rely on the government for every single thing, they can take all of that away and leave you with nothing. So, yeah, I, the, the role of the government is to govern. And that is it. You're responsible for yourself. You're responsible for your bills. Uh, I, I look at it as just another stranger. You don't know them. So I wouldn't put all of my trust in them. Uh, but that's that's my uh, thoughts on that. You know, and I, I think just one thing I want to add here, and, and this is, you know, where our, our friends, you know, from the progressive movement kind of come from on this. And this is the this is the argument that we have to contend with since COVID-19 is the, the subject of everybody's anxieties today, is that they will say among these, you know, the thing that are, are on unalienable rights is life, <laughs> liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, as, long as, as well as the property concept. And so we need to be able to contend with this idea that government's job is to protect life 
which might be to protect people from unnecessary death as a result of a pandemic. This is the thing that we have to, to straddle and balance and, and be able to articulate. And I'm not even sure I have the right words on how to describe that. Like, you know, if it's the, if it's the government jobs to protect life, how do you draw those lines when everybody as citizens, I think, you know, outside of people who might be in this chat room, they want freedom from fear. They, they want to, you know, be able to walk around and not be anxious, but they're looking to government to not make them feel anxious instead of taking it on themselves to be stronger, uh, to not be fearful, to actually have courage, which is what we need more of. Um, this is the tension. So, yeah. So I guess my question is, how how have politicians been able to go beyond their limits? Like, what is what is the what's the biggest catalyst that they've been able to do that? Um, I, anybody can jump in on this. This is a genuine question. What what do you Fear. guys think? Fear. Fear. <laughs> and exploiting racial tensions, uh, yeah. you know, making people believe that the government is going to step in and somehow get rid of racism. Uh, it, it, it's just fear. Yeah, fear is the government's ultimate weapon. They wouldn't last 24 hours without it. <laughs> and that's what actually Robert Higgs quote. I just memorized it because I always loved it. And, but <laughs> and this is this is why, um, it, like, I try so much to advocate for people growing a spine when it comes to hate speech because it's it's that sort of like. Uh, it's that sort of rhetoric that allows the government to have more overreach, because if you're saying that hate speech leads to violence and it leads to some type of physical harm, then they're just going to keep weaponizing that. But if you're not uh, if you if you're not able to, uh, you know, react to hate speech, like it doesn't affect you, they have no power. They have no ammo. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for me, I mean, I don't want to just repeat fear, but I think fear is the, the correct answer. I'm a I'm a 9-11 child myself. And you know, we all grew up in that time period and saw just this sort of rapid expansion of government to launch the war on terror, uh, build the Department of Homeland Security, build the TSA, like all from scratch without ever having to prove that it does anything. And you're sort of seeing that same infrastructure leveraged now um, against everyday Americans of different political persuasions, whether it be far left or far right, uh, and then also used to try to police COVID-19. But one thing that I think a lot about is this concept known as the um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So it's sort of like the human experience put into a food pyramid and it breaks it down at the very bottom of the pyramid is physiological needs. So that's sort of like your air, you need water, food, shelter, you need clothing, stuff like that. And then as you move up the pyramid, you get towards safety needs like personal security, employment as part of safety because you need like income and stuff like that. And then after that, once you have secured those needs in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, then you get on to like love and belonging, self-esteem, self-actualization. And so as you get up to the very top of the pyramid, that's where you become the person you were always meant to be. But you can't do that until you've gotten the foundation figured out, which is I need a place to sleep and I need food in my belly. And government pretty much exists down there at the bottom with safety needs, personal security, resources, and then those physiological things. But they, it is always trying to consume everything above it. And I think right now, if you like go and Google, um, Google Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you'll see how the government is creeping into the love and belonging category. They're sort of like inching up the um, inching up the pyramid towards areas where civic organizations, churches, clubs, friendship used to be um, you know, the, the main thing, but, you know, government and the CDC and all these other people are basically gobbling up all of that space. Um, and we're sort of seeing that in rapid, rapid decline, right? The idea of like people actually joining clubs and lodges and civic groups uh, to find their love and belonging that's gone away and government fills the void. Well, I was, I was a 9-11 baby too. And just to add on to that, when you mentioned, you know, the TSA and everything that was formed after, it's basically the ratchet effect where, you know, the government ratchets up their power, but they never ratchet it back down to the original spot that it was at. So uh, what we're seeing now is basically the side effects of the ratchet, uh, ratcheting up of the 9-11, uh, you know, fear mongering. And 
now we're at the COVID fear mongering and they're going to ratchet it up some more so that for the next emergency or the next crisis, they can gain more power. And that's what we need to stop. That's a, that's a good point. Um, I wanted to add on to the fear aspect because I completely agree with you guys, but I would also add on the media as a distraction. So, you know, if we were to use 9-11 as an example, um, you know, I don't remember, granted, I was a little bit younger, but I don't remember in detail people fully understanding what the Patriot Act was and how much that would impact us. Or, and I remember, you know, there were, there were certain people who didn't like it per se, but it wasn't, it wasn't as much of an outrage that it should have been. Um, and, and I wonder how much has the media been uh, a distraction for people to understand how their rights are being infringed upon. Um, now, fast forward to today where we have independent media, um, we have a podcasts, we have conversations like this. We have far more outlets to get more information from people that we would have never have gotten from, uh, you know, even 10 years ago. Um, so now we're able to see in a more dutiful way how the government isn't, is impacting our everyday life, or at least attempting to, uh, how the government is attempting to overstep its boundaries, um, and how the government is wanting us to become more and more dependent. Uh, you know, one of the big things for me was the lockdowns. You know, the idea that millions of Americans are sitting and waiting for a $600 check as they have no job made no sense to me. And, and it made no sense as to why can't we just manage this particular situation? You know, I think almost collectively, maybe obviously not 100%, but it almost felt like a collective, okay, we'll give it the, was it the 14 days to end the spread or whatever, whatever amount of days it was. And people willfully restricted themselves because there was this grand mystery about what COVID was, but the goalposts just kept getting moved and moved and moved. And for me, that was one of those big like red pills to kind of see like, hold on a second. Wasn't it three months ago you guys said this? Hey, wasn't it six months ago you guys said this? And then now we're begging and groveling for a $600 check to come through. Meanwhile, this, this, uh, the bill that they passed went to basically special interest. We got the crumbs of it. And should this even have happened in the first place? So I, I wonder if the media was a complete distraction for many Americans for, for decades to not understand how corrupt Washington, D.C. is, how corrupt government has become and how much they've been overstepping their boundaries. Um, so anybody can jump in. What do you think about that? I mean, I, uh, I definitely agree with you where I think the media has done substantial damage throughout the years. And listen, I will be the first one to admit that I was brainwashed by the media at some point. I always listened to CNN. Uh, I had severe Trump derangement syndrome, even though I'm not infatuated with the guy, but just to give you an idea of how warped my brain was. And I just... I repeated everything that the media said when I when I think back to when I was so glued to the television. And and I think that's it is is they figured out that a lot of people, first of all, are always on their cell phones. They're they're always on some type of electronic device. So you you literally have an easy access to, you know, put whatever propaganda you want into their brain. So, yeah, I, I, I do. I do agree with that, that it's it's a long time coming. And they've even said, I, I think that in journalism, there's this thing called if it bleeds, it leads. And and that's pretty much their template. It's like, doesn't matter if it's correct news. It doesn't matter. It, 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 as long as it gets someone's attention, that's all they care about. And it's a good it's a good distraction. Yeah, well, I think. Ryan, go, ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say that, you know, we have so much independent media now, but all those independent voices are being silenced right now and they're being taken off of social media. Um, you know, we have this thing with Jack, he just left and this new guy's coming in and banning more and more. And so these voices are being silenced, even with Mises.org uh, for a Google search. Sometimes you, you don't even get the hits that you need. So you, you can see all of these places, you know, lining up together to silence the truth. And uh, yeah, all of it's just 
going away. So, so how do we get this information out to people? That, that is a question I have, and it's something that I haven't heard much about. I haven't heard of, you know, a new social media free place besides like Gab or something. So it, it's definitely something that as libertarians, we are, you know, libertarians, Republicans um, have to work on. Yeah, um, one of um, Jack's last projects that he worked on at Twitter, which is still being developed and researched, is this new new technology, new social technology that they call Blue Sky. So, I mean, I know I know we all kind of have mixed feelings about about Jack as the outgoing guy at Twitter, but the idea that I think he he has and he's still going to be working on is this. Um, it, not encrypted. That's not the right word. Blockchain based social media layer to the internet where it, Twitter will have to basically live um, as a platform off of the blue sky layer that it adds to the internet. It's going to be sort of like the next generation and it's going to be all blockchain and it's going to basically just bypass the ability of central powers to censor. I still think that that's a, a possibility. It's a little bit in like that cyberpunk future realm where I, I can't picture what it is but if you look up jack blue sky you can kind of read about it a little bit there was an article in barry weiss's Substack about it this morning and it, it gives me hope but I, I feel like we're in this period of intense illiberalism as adam sort of teed up for the entire segment we're seeing after like decades and decades of liberal liberalization post-world war ii that that's halted and i think now we're going to start heading downhill into a period of illiberalism until we get some really smart people who kick the doors back open again. And I think that's going to be blockchain. Um, and I'm, yeah. I'm not even an expert on that. I just, you know, I just, that that's the technology that's going to bar us from these companies and the government from us. Well, I hold Bitcoin mainly because um, I think the Fed should be abolished. I am big on abolishing the Fed. And I think it's one of the main things that has enabled this COVID madness because you know, they can just go to the Fed, print off some money and, oh, there's six trillion dollars right there. And, you know, that that's causing the inflation. And a lot of people are arguing about that online, too. But, you know, inflation is a monetary issue, no matter what you think that that is what inflation is. And, and you know, it's just like one hand washing the other and we need to somehow break away from it all. I, I do like Jack, though. Um, he did share a Rothbard article not very long ago, or, or you know, as Anatomy of the State. So I have a little bit of hope in the guy, but I'm like, why'd you have to leave us? So that was my feelings about him. You know, part of me kind of thinks like uh, when when certain new things start to I don't want to say fail, but or kind of run its course, people tend to go backwards. So I kind of wonder if the days of internet forums will start to come back, you know, where we have very specific niches where people just kind of splinter off into, you know, like a free speech area. And then people who are far left can go to their far left forums and the right can go to their right forums, libertarians to their forums. You know, I, I kind of feel like we're going back to the, we may possibly go back to the decentralization, but getting off of social media on our own. Um, I've kind of seen it in some ways. I've seen more websites pop up. I mean, my website, uh, even though it's not a, uh, a social media-ish or form platform, but at least allows for people to express themselves without being censored by you know some grand overlord. Um, so I wonder if that's actually something that could catch on where we just start going to particular websites where people can discuss with each other rather than getting hit arbitrarily by AI, but more user uh, moderators and, and things like that who have more of a conscience. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I have, I have mixed feelings about that. I mean, one of the things that I think has gone wrong with the world, and this, this might be where I diverge from some of the other panelists, uh, as a, I, I call myself an aspiring libertarian, meaning that I try to do my best uh, to be libertarian every day I wake up, but I, I, a lot of times I, I fail. Um, you know, I, I'm really concerned about social cohesion and us actually being one people. 
And this sort of market instinct, which I think is routed towards individual user preference, people wanting to spend time around people who are only like them, because that's what's natural. I, I think that's just sort of the way that it is. But in many ways, there used to be artificial barriers that sort of <laughs> forced us to all just sort of be amongst each other in the pre-internet and social media era. And that was in many ways a good thing for us. And I, I just am very skeptical of more spaces to us to sort out into is going to be good for us. And, and I guess to focus on like the role of government, it's just that I really don't want the government like calling the shots on where we can and cannot sort. But I don't think that sorting is good. Well, I'm kind of an old right libertarian, kind of like Rothbard type. And, you know, a lot of what I think is missing in society right now is culture. And uh, what we have lost as a nation is our, you know, individuality. And uh, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm not a feminist. <laughs> I kind of believe that, you know, if you're an individual and you see yourself as an individual, you don't need these, you know, click groups like, you know, feminism, BLM, all these things, it just goes down to the individual. And I think we've definitely lost that as a nat nation. So that's what I believe. Prophet, do you have anything to add? Uh, I, you know, I'm kind of on the side with uh, Stephen on this one because I also, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember like chat rooms and AOL message boards and things like that. And, you know, you had different categories, but by and large, the internet was just a free for all. You know, everyone was kind of just forced to be with everyone. And I think that's how it should be. I think part of the problem now is there's so many different sectors of the internet where people can just willingly flock to their own designated echo chambers. And that's just, I think, creating more of a problem. I think People need to be desensitized from the uh, from being so outraged when they hear a different opinion or they see someone that's on the different uh, end of the political spectrum. They need to be uh, kind of just forced to mingle, I think, because then then they, they're going to get over it. I, and I think part of it is we have a lot of people in power right now, a lot of people in academia in particular that are sort of encouraging these echo chambers that I think are just very unhealthy. So I hope that that's not the case. I, I, I don't think we need to go backwards. Well, so I guess just to oh, go ahead, Natalie, please. I was going to say, well, that's where it comes back to the individual. I mean, if you're an individual, you, you don't need the echo chambers and you respect people as an individual for their own individual opinions. That's kind of like my point type thing. You know, you, you don't need all these clicks. You just need to, you know, respect the individual opinion and what they do. Um, Mises once had a quote, and it was a really fantastic quote. And it was, if a man drinks water and not wine, I cannot say that he's acting uh, irresponsibly. I can only say that in his place, I would not do so. And that was Ludwig von Mises. And, and that's kind of like my, my life motto, because I, I can't tell other people what to do. I can only make the individual choice for myself. Yeah, I so... This is this is probably a little controversial to say, but like one of the one of the areas in which I, I really doubt sort of the ability for like the atomized individual to do what is best for themselves is particularly in the area of social media. And so since we're talking about the role of government, I, I was listening to Joe Rogan's show earlier this week and he had the guys on from the Center for Humane Technology. I, I really admire what these guys are doing over there to try to make the technology sector more oriented towards human happiness. And they were talking about how China is handling this. And China is a nightmarish country with a nightmarish totalitarian ideology. But I also believe that if we want to have a government by and for the people, we actually have to have a government that does take stands on what, <laughs> and I, I say like government as if it's not like part of the people in some way, but the government has to do things that it might think are good for the people. And social media is not good for the people and it's making our kids dumber. It's making them stressed out and anxious and it's making us tear ourselves apart. And so China has instituted a couple of things. I'm just gonna rattle them off real quick. They have now instituted 40 minute daily time limits for kids uh, uh, over the age of 14. The app is closed to young people at night. You cannot use social media apps of, of various types after 10 p.m all the way to 6 a.m. for the express purpose that kids should be able to like 
know that the world is not going on without them while they're sleeping. So apps turn off at that time. They're also blocking five second or they're instituting five second pauses between videos so that you can't just binge videos uninterrupted. So they make it harder for you to be comfortable just watching videos. And then they also are just not allowing kids to be on social media without being fed educational content. So this is the area where the nationalism comes in. China is feeding them educational and patriotic content about math, science, and the glory of the state uh, in between some of the videos they watch, which I don't like that one. But my point here is, is like China is taking a stand and saying, we want to have a better, healthier country and one that will rule the 21st century. And the United States is just sitting here with all of our people's thumbs up our butts, hoping that the tech sector is going to save us. And I don't think they will. Well, I, I think that's how you get North Korea, to be yeah. honest with you, no, because I, I hear you. Th- I mean, that that's definitely on the path to totalitarianism. And when you go down that path, it's very dark and it doesn't end well. And we already have a mechanism in society that takes care of how much, you know, tablet time kids get. It's called parents. And we have to yes. remember that. And we yes. have to go back to the parents. And it's our responsibility to limit these things. Like, you know, I have I have three children and the oldest is 15, the middle child's 13, and I have a three-year-old. So I have two teenagers and a toddler. And, you know, each of them, all of their TV time is limited. You know, their tablet time, it's limited. By, you know, eight o'clock, they're in bed. So, I mean, we have parents to do that. We don't need the government to nanny us. And we have to get away from that mindset, especially with, you know, COVID. We have to start taking care of our own health. The government is not responsible for our health. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say the government is responsible for our health. We have to start taking control of that. If you are afraid of, like, things like COVID and, you know, I have an autoimmune disorder, but I still went outside. I caught COVID. And, you know, I went through it by, you know, taking my vitamins, making sure I drink enough water, making sure, you know, if I did get sick, I did get sicker and I did actually need antibiotics and I went to the doctor and I got them. So we have to definitely just start taking control of our lives and remember that that's not the role of government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I resonate a lot with what you're saying. And I want to respond to it just real quick. It's like, I agree. (laughs) This is the job of parents. And an entire generation of parents, particularly Gen Xers, have have just really failed. And I guess like a a wave of boomers as well in actually parenting their children and saying yes and no to certain things. Uh, My daughter, she's 10, uh, does not have any devices and is not going to. Uh, And I I sort of put that, you know, down like really, really early and it's going to stay that way. Um, My kids are but, banned from social media. I have to yeah, <laughs> they're banned. Uh, no devices, no accounting. It's not going to happen. I also just started homeschooling uh, about six months ago. So we're, we're new to that. And we're sort of brexiting that system. Hi, but, hi. You know, you can send the Tuttle Twins books. I'm going to, I'm going to. Oh, yes. Everyone books. go get the Tuttle Twins. If you want like <laughs> a way to talk to your kids about economic concepts and individual liberty Tuttle with Twins. really great comic cartoons, search the Tuttle Twins right now and go get yeah. those. I love um, them. But, you know, Natalie, like, I, I hear you 100%. It's just I'm also, like, really exhausted as a libertarian with sort of, like, making every everything is always, like, the government, you know, is awful. The government can't be trusted, ba da ba da ba And I feel like it pushes us out of the space of actually trying to have a government that works well. And I really want it to work well and, like, actually take positions when our our enemies on the global stage are doing everything they can to try to to knock us down a peg and i just i just feel like if we can do the self-help thing really effectively in this room we can all talk about you know you know being better parents and being better people we've got to be a better country and that does start in washington at some in some capacity that has to happen there i I believe it has to nothing good happens in washington (laughs) dc nothing (laughs) The only thing good in Washington, D.C. right now is Thomas Massey. And bless his heart, I love him. He is trying. He's a good but, boy. Yeah, he's a very good guy. Um, and it, that's like the only thing good in Washington, D.C. right now. <laughs> it used to be Ron Paul, but he's gone. So now we're left with Thomas Massey. Uh, Justin Amash, yeah. you know, Rand Paul, too. But those that's it, you know. So, so um, I'm sorry. Um I actually wanted to I wanted to interject a little bit because Stephen Stephen brought up China, um, 
and I know this, in some ways it sounds far-fetched, but in other ways it doesn't sound far-fetched because we know it, it exists, uh, a social credit score. You know, is that something that is possible to happen in America where the government gives us some sort of score, some sort of rating, uh, or treats us differently based on our compliance uh, with whatever demands? And, and in some ways, the, the attempt in some places in the United States to have vaccine mandates, um, to me, is like that first step towards a sort of social credit score, because if you don't get the vaccine, they pretend like, oh, it's OK, actually, you do have a choice. You just won't be able to go here. You won't be able to do this. You won't be able to do that. Uh, but you cannot have the vaccine, but you'll just have to get tested every week. You'll have to do this. Right. Um, they pretend that it's a choice, but in reality, uh, it's it's a punishment, right, for making a choice. So, and it's not the same thing. Um, and, and I wonder if this is, if, for example, I know right now what's going on with OSHA. If that mandate for OSHA goes through, is that the first step towards a unofficial social credit score? Yeah, it would be. I don't. I don't think the OSHA thing will go through. Um, thank heavens and thank the courts. But uh, yeah, I think government's role is to protect us from social credit scores being possibly intimate. Uh, uh, what's the word? Initiated by private sector actors. You know, if there are elements where different social companies are wanting to actually sort of create social scoring systems for individuals. Um, you know, I think that is a space where there should be a government role in saying that this can't happen. And whether that's whether that's Congress or whether that's courts, like there has to be a mechanism to say there there can be none of this, because as soon as Facebook, Twitter, Google and the government collaborate on social credit scores, it's over and we'll never be able to escape them. I would be so screwed if that happened. So honestly. screwed. None of us would be allowed to go outside. No, we wouldn't be able to go grocery shopping or get food or, or anything. Get a, get a home loan. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, honey. Oh, okay. No, I was going to say, like, I, I think we're already on the verge of doing that. I mean, just look at the rhetoric of how they treat people in America who are compliant with what the government is asking or compliant with social justice movements. Because let's be real. Like, BLM, they played a huge role in this administration. Like, let's be real. So if you if you just look at the rhetoric of like, these are the good people. These are the ones on the right side of history. The people that are on the side of liberty are the fascists. They're the bigots. There's, you know, it, it's they're trying to slowly condition people to adopt to this idea of a social credit system. And even looking in areas where they have the vaccine passports already implemented, you can't even go to the movie theater. You can't just go about your day without injecting something into your body. They want compliance. And yeah, I do think that that is personally, I think that's the end game. Well, yeah, I, I agree with that hundred percent. And, you know, I, I started speaking out March, 2020, on the COVID hysteria. So I, right from the beginning, I was against it. And I was called so many names, like a Nazi. Uh, my favorite though was Aryan Barbie. I, I kept that title. I, I actually liked it. I was like, I've never been called a Barbie in my life, so I'm keeping it. But um, yeah, Nazi, fascist, all those things. And they will not stop. They, they want to have people see you as the bad guy. And that's what they're doing with the vaccines. You know, you're in the minority if you're unvaccinated and I'm unvaccinated because, you know, I caught COVID and I have natural antibodies and you're not hearing about that either. You're not hearing about natural antibodies and that frustrates me a lot, but you are in a minority if you're unvaccinated. So Yeah, I have vaccine regret myself. That's, uh, that's just something I'll have to carry with me for the rest of my days. But I told uh, people yeah. not to get it. <laughs> yeah, it is what it is, right? But um, no, I mean, I think with like the social credit score system, the uh, the real threat in my mind is never it's not not never, but not really like Congress or the White House, because I feel like they're so feckless and ineffective at doing anything without getting blocked by the courts, which is in most cases for liberty, a good thing. But the bureaucracy who don't need to be cleared to do anything, the CDC and the administration and bureau of this and that on these buildings all across Washington, DC. Nobody checks these people. And that's why we need freedom fighters in DC whose entire mission 
is to dissolve bureaucracy in Washington and start shrinking down the size of federal bureaucrats who basically are just living off of the system completely rent free and on our dimes. It's, it's really, really gross. And it's these kind of administrations, it's the Fauci's of the world who basically just hide out at the CDC and do whatever they want. Uh, they're the people who are going to pass social credit scores into, into sort of de facto law with social media companies. And they'll do it unopposed because nobody checks bureaucrats. Yeah, well, look how, much, yeah, look how much the power of the CDC has gotten in this last year. I mean, can, could they stop the rent? Uh, what was that? The rent something they stopped? Yeah, the in... rent moratorium. Moratorium, yeah. yeah. Amazing. The CDC they involved that. in housing. And, and, and did you see another thing today that they wanted a list of all the people coming from Africa from the major airlines? I'm like, where is their power to, to do this? That's Is that the power of the CDC? Can, can they do that? I mean, no. I mean, all these things that they're starting to gain power and it's like, you need that through Congress. And that's another thing that a lot of people don't understand is that if Biden even wanted to do this mandate, he had to put it through Congress, you know, through the House and everything. And that didn't happen. So this is even a mandate. This is something a lot of people need to understand that this is not a real mandate. It's basically a glorified soapbox announcement. He, he got on a stand. He, he said, I'm going to require this. But, you know, there's no law. There's no real mandate. Um, none of it was voted on. So, yeah, people are, you know, I, I'm waiting for the day people wake up and they're like, wow, I actually got a vaccine and I never had to because it was unconstitutional. So I'm waiting for people to wake up, but I, I don't know if that's actually going to happen or if they're just going to be able to forever be like a Fauci type uh, God savior type complex. Well, not just for people to wake up. Where are the lawsuits? Like, I've been asking that for, since day one. Where, where are the lawsuits that are ha supposed to be happening around this country? Where are these, uh, you know, crazy lawyers who are looking for any reason to sue the government, uh, you know, for whatever reason? I, I see so many different situations. I think most of us see situations where the government is clearly overstepping and implementing things that, like you said, are not law. A mandate is not a law. And... Where are the lawsuits against law enforcement who are enforcing mandates um, right. that are unconstitutional? You know, there, there, you can go down the list. There's a, there's a ton of different things. Um, and I'm personally waiting for it. Well, I think they just passed the CMS mandate and uh, they just put a stop to it. And then they just put a stop to uh, the federal contract mandate. And there was another mandate they just put a stop to. And I forget it off, off the top of my head, uh, maybe... Stefan or Goths will know, but um, yeah, they, they, considering that they just put a stop to it, I don't, I think the lawsuits would soon be coming because people are like, well, I didn't have to get it. Why did I get it? And then you'll see that too, you know, people had, you know, vaccine injuries that haven't quite shown up yet and they will eventually. I mean, th this vaccine is completely untested. Um, we're still in the testing phase, I believe. I believe it ends in what, 2025. And uh, yeah. Uh, that I just read something from the CDC the other day that said that, you know, we don't think this does anything to five to 11 year olds, but we'll know for sure in five years and we'll come back to that and, you know, give our results then. And I'm just like, they're basically using your kids as guinea pigs because they don't know. So. Yeah, exactly. And, and actually you brought me to another, another point is, you know, the willful compliance by private industry, especially, um, well, there's particular industries as well. So what I've noticed is if, let's say said company is in a blue area and Biden and, and Democrats in general are for whatever, um, there is this willful compliance to go along with that despite what their employees want, uh, just no holds bar to go along with it. Um, you know, so I'll give you an example. My, my wife, she works in Manhattan. Uh, she works for uh, an institution. And, you know, they had something where in order for, their, for her to work there, she does have to get the flu vaccine. But that is something that is understood the minute she walks through that door. And I, I cannot stand how people act like what is happening right now is something that has always existed. This is not normal for a job 
to say, you must get this, otherwise you cannot work here anymore. That is not part of your deal when, you, when it comes to working for this particular place. And she was basically told, if you do not get the vaccine, you will get fired. And even, to, even down to the, the top of the organization, no holds barred said, I will fire anybody if they do not get it. Now this is, this is liberal leaning New York City and a very liberal organization. And they have no problem going along with it. And the government is kind of like the catalyst for this to happen, right? So it's, yeah. I, I have an issue with um, how the government in many ways is utilizing private industry. That's kind of what they were trying to do with OSHA, even though uh, I think Stephen's right, I think it's gonna fall through. But they're trying to use OSHA to push companies to comply and force their employees to get vaccinated, uh, even though it's, I, in my opinion, it's completely unnecessary to do so. And there's, there's the, the conversation can go in a million different ways, but there is a willful compliance when it comes to private industry. And that is one of those things where, yeah, government has a whole bunch of flaws. There's a lot of things that we could talk about that the government is doing wrong, but I think sometimes we give a free pass to private companies. Oh, well, it's their business. They can do whatever they want. No, I mean, there has to be some sort of limitations when it comes to things like this. And for in my wife's situation, she did not have, a, have any sort of work contract that involved the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, it, let's say tomorrow, she didn't work there and tomorrow she applied and said, you must give the flu vaccine and the COVID-19 vaccine to work here, mm -hmm. then to me, that is something that she can either reject mm -hmm. or accept. But this, you know, people, and, and I find it funny how these people were our heroes, uh, you know, these nurses and people in the medical industry, uh, they were our heroes, make a TikTok videos uh, last year, and all of a sudden half of them are these pariahs and they're scumbags. Um, simply because they want to make a personal choice. So uh, I know I just yeah. kind of went off a little bit, but you guys can take it what, anywhere. <laughs> nah, yeah. what, what the government's basically, what they have done is they've made the private sector their own little police force. And, you know, there are many companies and many people who don't want to enforce it, but they believe they had to. And then there's the other end of it. Um, there are some private companies that have used the government mandate to enforce their own liberal policies. And what it boils down to is uh, with uh, a lot of these stops that judges have put in recently, they've removed that government element. So people will be able to, you know, start suing very soon. And mm -hmm. you're, you're going to see that start to come to a head um, because, you know, they don't have that protection of daddy government anymore. And but like, like Stefan said earlier, you know, people use that as kind of like a soft cover. And it, it, I, personally, I think it's great that the government's being you know, ripped away from this mandate thing. And you're gonna start seeing a lot of private companies true colors. Yeah, you mentioned, Adam, this, this will take us back in the direction of like social media companies and, and also like, you know, merchandising companies and stuff like that for, for, for commenting on the private sector. But you're like, we need solutions. So here's one solution that was put forward by, by Marco Rubio, which I don't entirely like this guy, but uh, he introduced a bill a couple of weeks ago and it was titled the Mind Your Own Business Act. And the Mind Your Own Business Act is basically a bill that would allow and give uh, the ability back to shareholders and companies, which I think all of us out there who are of the capitalist mindset believe that shareholders should actually have a say in what goes on at companies and that CEOs and corporate boards should make decisions that are in the best financial interests of their shareholders. Right now, shareholders can't sue for mismanagement of the companies by hyper woke left wing boards. So when Nike goes off the deep end and does something stupid with their their brand, right? They try to segment the uh, the audience, right? And they try to do stuff that's super left wing with their shoes. Um, the shareholders don't have a mechanism to say, 
hey, you guys are mismanaging our financial interests as people who are invested in this company. You need to prove to us that you actually have a plan here to maximize the money that we're going to make, or are you just virtue signaling with our dollars? And I actually find this to be really interesting because right now, federal law, you're not allowed to actually take that action against a woke corporate board. But the, uh, the Mind Your Own Business Act would clear the way for you to actually take legal action. So shareholders might then start speaking up and you might then see CEOs be like, oh, wait, this culture war crap that we're doing, we actually will have to prove in a court of law that we had a financial plan here to do well by our shareholders. And uh, maybe you'd see that walked back. So maybe that's something government could do. That'd be interesting. Um, I, I just want to jump in here. So I know, Natalie, you have a hard out at 830. Um, I want to take uh, anybody who wants to speak out and wants to add to the conversation. Um, I know we have one person who's requesting to speak. So we'll use this time to, to um, have somebody jump in, basically. So um, Kayla, I will add you as a speaker. All right, Kayla, you can unmute yourself. Sorry, I'm also working right now, driving a truck. No, I was going to no talk about the fact that I was going to chime in on the whole social credit score. Later on, I can actually pull out some information about that. But there is a hidden social credit score out there on all of us as it is that I know of. It's pretty rough okay. because it talks about how risky you are. And it's like if you pull up your name and then it'll, get to, it'll show up like every address you ever lived at and your current address, how safe you are because of family connections or even friends that are around you or even just the neighborhood you live in. It's pretty scary as it is. It's hidden, but it's there if you know where to look for it. And I found it. Well, you guys, you guys might remember the old uh, website, Clout. Do you guys remember Clout? It basically gave you a social media credit score. Yes. No, that isn't something there. Yeah, it, it ended in 2014, but, you know, that was that was long before, you know, most of the Twitter madness or Facebook stuff. But there there are several, like, uh, social media credit score engines out already on if you if you go looking for them. Now, I remember them. I have to look it up again. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, but I appreciate you uh, bringing that up and, and, and wanting to address it. Um, we will go to, uh, and gothics, don't feel shy. Jump in any time. <laughs> uh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm trying to, I'm trying to withhold some of the things that I say, because I, I can get a little spicy with this topic. No, let's <laughs> lose. So I spicy. Go, I can get a little spicy. And, and, and I feel like it would be more productive if you don't have a, a an angry black woman screaming. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're only here uh, to do one thing. <laughs> You know, but like, go, you know, going back to what you said, Adam, you're, you're totally right. It is not normal for jobs to be firing people. And what is happening is a, it's a literal template of what they do in communist China, where if you speak against the regime, you lose your livelihood. Like they'll take away your ability to make money. So that's happening in America, but on in a different way. Is there sort of conditioning people to say, if you do not comply, if you do not do as we say, you're not going to be able to feed your family. So this is why I tell people, forget this this is a private business nonsense. Like we know, like Adam said, if you're already working at a job, you're not going to have your boss walk up to you and say, hey, if you put this up your butt, uh, you're going to be able to stay here and work here. Uh, but if you don't, we're going to fire you. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but if it was something like where, uh, you know, you initially go to apply, you have the you have the option to say, no, I'll just go out and I'll do my own thing. I'll start my own business. Uh, so we're in a very dangerous uh, territory right now that we even allowed this to get this far. 
You know, I, I work I work for the Mises Institute, and they are um, nonprofit, and they did not stop for COVID. They kept doing events all of 2020 and 21. Um, at the events, you never had to wear a mask if you don't want to. And there were there would be like 200 people at events. And uh, my boss Jeff Dice, he would uh, find venues that would allow all of this, and that was very difficult. And he doesn't require a vaccine, so there are businesses out there pushing back, you know, against the narrative. All right, um, Jeff, I'm going to add you as a speaker. And Gothics, thank you for giving uh, your spiciness over there. Keeping spicy is uh, great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I will. All right, Jeff, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you, everybody, for having this talk. And uh, yes, Gothics, uh, be sp as spicy as you'd like. Um, to take it back to the beginning um, about the, you know, people wanting government for because they're afraid of things. I think the biggest thing that everybody needs to be afraid of and, and actually is afraid of without necessarily thinking about it is the fear of the government monopoly on the use of force, right? So that's the only reason why people comply with these mandates or anything else they do is because they're afraid of government officials coming down and putting them in a cage. Um, we see it in Australia now. Mm -hmm. They're putting unvaccinated people in camps. Um, you know, people are breaking out of them and police are chasing them down. So um, that's very nearly where we are. I think um, we may get there at some point. Uh, I'd like to think that the second amendment is uh, a deterrent, but from what I've seen in the last 18 months or so, I, I don't think there are enough people to, to go against them. I think, uh, I think things could turn very badly, very quickly. I mean, and this is also what I tell people that are always watching the news is like to pay attention to whenever the media will talk about a, a mass shooting or something like that. Like, look what they did to Kyle Rittenhouse, right? It was just this 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 white supremacist with a, a gun and he was mowing down innocent black people. It's like they'll take these stories, they'll hyper fixate on it to, uh, to hope that people watching will think that there is this epidemic of uh, mass shooters going out. And the reason that they're doing that is I personally believe they're trying to get people to hand over their guns because that is literally the last step for them to say that, that, that there's no barrier for the government to, uh, to not take control of your lives, right? Once you take that away, we're screwed. Uh, turn off the TV. Okay, that's it. It was really amazing that during the Rittenhouse discourse, the media were, all the pundits were on TV saying that this basically gave license to people to go out to demonstrations and shoot people at will. Just absolute lying and doing it brazenly and openly. Steven, you're missing something. He brought it across state lines. <laughs> <laughs> I crossed state lines the other day. I feel guilty and dirty myself. <laughs> I've, been, I've been trafficked by my own hands. Oh, Lord. Well, yeah, 2A is stopping the government right now, and I think we have to respect it and defend it and hold it close. As for Kyle Rittenhouse, I think a lot of people – you know, and this goes back to people being educated in public schools and not understanding that, you know, they have the God-given right to protect their life and their property. A lot of people don't get that, and they need to start understanding that. Um, but, yeah, the Kyle thing was messed up. Well, you know, I think just in terms of, of, you know, the role of government, we clearly have lost touch with what the role of government is. I am personally at the point, and, and again, I, I know we kind of got a, a general anti-government vibe here going on, but I just sort of believe that government will always exist and we just have to deal with it uh, and try to make it as good as possible. That's where I'm at these days as a person. And, it is not fit to exist. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just gonna finish that thought, but like, 
the, the general idea in the, the Declaration of Independence is that if it is no longer securing our rights, if it has become destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to, quote, alter it or abolish it. Uh, and I'm probably on team alter. And I would like to see some actual altering going on, whether it be, you know, actually having a constitutional convention, reasserting our rights and and re-debating like who we want to be as a country and then winning the debate obviously that could go very wrong do you want, do you want 2021 to be debating our rights i mean think about that for a second <laughs> I, I, I believe i believe Whoa. in the people in this room and i believe in the people on our side who are elected officials just but those are people rights. on our side what, what would happen is we would get the worst of the worst and that that that's what i fear we're, we're headed towards total societal breakdown right now we actually have to try and govern ourselves or the bureaucrats are going to govern us for us. If we don't so, actually do the job of trying to f create the government that is going to be over us, then we're not so, going to have one at all. Well, I, I am definitely a, a Spooner girl. I love Spooner, um, Lysander. And, um, you know, uh, basically, if you've never heard of Lysander Spooner, um, he, he was, you know, a guy who did not like the Constitution at all. Um, I'm, I'm definitely more of an Articles of Confederation girl. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but I think the Constitution okay. actually actually grants too much power to the government, you know, and it gives them too much reign to, you know, hang us all with. But, you know, there's, there's another option that we really didn't get into tonight. I hope maybe we'll come back and talk about it another time. But secession. Um, a lot of oh, people don't understand or talk <laughs> about secession. And why not let the blue states go their way? Let the red states go their way? I mean, America is what, uh, 200 and some odd years old? The average lifespan for a nation is 148 years. We are way past due for a breakup. And there are many European countries that could you know, fit inside Texas. So we have 330 million people in this country. Why should we all be forced to get along and follow the same set of rules? Why not break us up? You know what? You just gave me an idea for another uh, topic that maybe in the future, succession. I know people bring it up, um, but maybe it's something we should discuss. You know, I have a certain feeling about it, but maybe it's something we could discuss publicly and people could chime in. Um, Natalie, I'm not forcing you out. I'm just trying to respect your time. Do you have to do you have to head out? Yeah, I'm going to be heading out, but it was great talking to you guys. And thanks, everyone, for listening. I appreciate you guys. Have a yeah, good night. And Natalie, it was nice talking to you. I'm going to follow your coattails out because I got to put my kid to bed. That's probably yeah. what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I, that's actually exactly what I'm doing. Yeah, Gothics, it's, it's, please it's, get it's super spicy time, for so us. So. Hey, nice talking to you all. <laughs> all right, Love you guys. Have a great night. night. All right. Um, and we will go to Stephen. You said you can stay for a bit or he, is he jumping out? I guess he's jumping out too. So it's just me and you, Gothics. How you All doing? All right. All right. Doing pretty, <laughs> good. doing pretty good. But you know what? Maybe I'm just too cynical. I don't even think secession is an option. Like, I, I, I feel like they're trying to make it so we can't do that. Uh, because, I, and, and this is just based on hearing the rhetoric of new world order several times in different countries. I don't think they're going to give us that option. Yeah. Maybe, uh, well, listen, I think this is, that's a whole, that's a whole other topic, but let's, I know we have people who want to speak. So, uh, let me, let me get them in here. Dante, I'm going to add you as a speaker. You can unmute yourself. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> How I'm, you doing? Hi, I'm Dante. Hi, Gothics. I love your content. <laughs> uh, Hi, <Dad. laughs> Oh, man, this is so weird um, <clears throat> to think that we could never get connection with YouTubers. I always thought YouTubers were like a completely different type of people. Like they're they're too famous to like talk to normal people, everyday people. So, <laughs> um, well, <clears throat> Um, I think this whole COVID thing, they're, they're just going to keep pushing it until, uh, you know, the wheels fall off. Um, and I've been quite sick of things myself. Uh, I live in Florida, Orlando, Florida. Um, and it's, uh, 
it's all right out here. It's not too bad. Uh, of course, you still have your your. I, well, I don't want to talk down it. More weirdos that wear masks inside cars for whatever reason. <laughs> um, but uh, in the beginning of this, you know, I was kind of scared myself, and you know, it was it was all strange to me. Like, oh my god, this. But it it, it all seemed familiar before. You know, when the flu came around, uh, and that was a big deal. Um, and uh, or that other thing, if somebody can help me out here, when Obama was in office, what what was that? Uh, the swine flu? No, it. Where where was it? Not the swine flu. Um, Ebola. Yeah, Ebola. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> when that thing was a was a thing, and uh, I'm just like, I don't know. I haven't caught it uh, since this whole thing started. Um, I I pretty much take vitamins and i stay away from fast food and i don't stay away from sodas and only drink black coffee and take vitamins and eat i mean i don't i don't see what else you can really do i i find it funny that people are trying to deny uh your natural immune system which is plausibly stupid um also i just don't see why they don't uh do this like they did the flu uh everyone has seemed to forgotten uh, that, you know, flu is still a thing. Uh, I even heard some people in other spaces say that, you know, they got the COVID and it felt like the flu. And it's like, well, did you ever stop to think that maybe you got the flu and you didn't get COVID? I'm, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, it's it's an unrealistic thing. Um, but uh, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's overboard at this point. Um, and a whole thing between if you get the vax, if you don't get the vax, you're a terrible person and all this other stuff. Um, and what I've always told people, like I've said plenty of times before, is that there's a difference between, you know, your normal everyday average. I'm just trying to get by, work hard, uh, provide for my family, liberal. And then there's the extremists, just like, you know, there's extremists on the right as well. Uh, and you can have some con uh, extreme uh, conservatism as well. Um I think there's good people on both sides. It's just that the left and the extremists has been showing their ass far more uh, than anybody, uh, as I've seen. And <laughs> imagine, too, imagine, if you will, uh, nagging at a man for several years uh for being racist or saying racial things, but uh, hiring an actual race and putting an actual racist in office. Uh, wasn't, didn't Kamala Harris, uh, wasn't Kamala Harris like part of a DEA or something like that? Or is that just like a myth, myth, mythical thing? Like that doesn't exist. Didn't she like, well, she was, she was a prosecutor. Yeah. yeah. So, so didn't she prosecute yeah. people for like little to nothing? Like, like, and they were mainly black. Like I'm, I'm confused here on that whole situation. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not. So if anybody can help me on that, if, if it's not, I'm, Maybe I'm spreading misinformation. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, the whole race thing is stupid. It's dumb. You have bad people on all sides. It doesn't matter what race you are. I, I'm pretty much the person. If you do something stupid and you kill somebody or you, you know, you're just being complaint, completely ignorant, you know, I don't care what color you are. I'm going to call you out for you. Um, growing up, um, I was brain trying, or at least they tried to brainwash me into this uh, because of your skin color uh, that, you know, you would be looked at differently and you'll be chased by cops and white people are out to get you. And I'm just like, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I grew up in a foster system, so that didn't really mind me. And most of the places I've been through were in the hood. Uh, until I got older, and um, I and that's funny uh, as far as the whole racism things goes because a lot of the racism uh, came from my own. So that was just I was like, huh? I thought I thought it was white people. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, um, you know, it's I, you went a bunch of different avenues, um, but in general, I, to, to talk about the you know, the COVID-19 mandates. I think you're right. I think that there is, um, I think a lot of people were scared in the beginning. Uh, they were scared and unsure as to what was going on. Um, I've always kind of had the viewpoint of, it is slightly worse than the flu for certain people. And actually uh, for certain people, it's far less 
uh, dangerous um, than the flu, uh, especially when you're talking about children. Um, so that's that for me, the whole mandates for children uh, to get the vaccine and, and things of that nature to me just feels uh, completely unnecessary. Um, Gothics, what do you what do you think? I am so sorry. I am multitasking to find dinner right now. <laughs> so I did not even hear that. I'm so sorry. No, nah, it's okay. What are you doing? DoorDash or something? <laughs> We're trying to figure that out, but everything's kind of closing. So I think I might have to head out because I'm snapping. Okay. If you have to jump out, just let me know when you're when you're going to jump out. Yeah, I think I'll, I think I'm going to jump out now. I'm really sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Don't worry. Hey, I'll wrote, I'll write solo on this. But thank hey, you for coming okay. on. Definitely. Let me know the next time you have one. I'd love to join in. Absolutely. We'll do. Right. Bye, everyone. All right. So it is myself, and I'm going to add Esteban. You can unmute yourself. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I wanted to mention that uh, what Natalie said about that America has no culture. And I disagree with that. I think America has a culture. I just think it's getting killed by wokeism. And uh, I've been seeing it in comic books a lot lately. Um, they do a lot of doctrina indoctrination with the way they speak. And they put the whole um, anti-gun speak or they even put how cops are racist and they want to kill black people and they even put the whole um gender thing in the comic books how uh gender is a social construct and uh if they also do the um gay characters are always just their sexuality there's no personality with them besides their sexuality and, I've seen it on TV and movies as well, but I noticed it first started in comic books and now it's just breeding everywhere. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's the whole point for them that what they're trying to do is change culture. Uh, I agree with you. America does have a culture and you start to realize it. I think for a lot of people, they realize it when they leave America. Um, and when you go to another place and you see how different other places are, and the things that you took for granted um, or the things that seemed normal to you, um, once you go somewhere else, those things don't exist. Um, your viewpoints. Um, I think even people who are left-leaning have a certain viewpoint on freedom that doesn't exist in other places. Uh, there are plenty of liberals who have guns, but uh, you go to someone who is maybe in Western Europe and they're like, why do you guys have guns? Ask an Australian. Why do you guys mm -hmm. have guns? What, what, you know, so there, there are aspects of American culture that exist. We definitely do have a culture. Uh, we have a variety of cultures. We have state cultures, um, regional yeah. cultures. You know, so America has a there's If there's humans, they have some sort of culture. They're going to make some sort of normality around it. But... Um, but thank you, Esteban, for, for adding in. I completely agree. Uh, the woke are, are fucking murdering everything that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to uh, Reveal. Reveal, you can unmute yourself. Hi. Right. Um, so... I wanted to, to comment on a lot of things, but uh, one of the things as far as like the government kind of deal, um, I definitely think that it needs to be pared down because th there's just so many hands in the cookie jar and nothing is getting done. And another thing that I wanted to touch on is like the whole private company thing and how they... Uh, you know, they're uh, just kind of jumping on the bandwagon with everything. And, and it's and they're doing like the most easiest thing that doesn't require much of them. So they'll just do PR stuff like with the BLM and uh, even the 
pride stuff or climate change things. Oh, they're eco-friendly, but then they don't. It's like, um, what's that uh, Tom McDonald song where it's like, uh, you got rid of uh, plastic straws wrapped in paper. Now you've got paper straws wrapped in plastic. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Let me ask you this. If you had a magic wand, what would you decrease in the government? Hmm. That's a hard one. I think my favorite that would uh, help my wallet would be taxation. <laughs> I hear you. That's not a bad answer. Um, <laughs> I, I'm right there with you, but um, I appreciate you you adding in to the to the conversation. Thank you. No problem. Um, one second here. I'm going to go to Jeff. I, I know we spoke. I'm going to skip you for now. I'm going to go to Gabriel. You can unmute yourself. Well, it's Gabriel, not Jeff. But uh, no, no, Je Jeff is uh, someone else who's waiting. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. I didn't want to assume the place of someone who you might have wanted to. You know, I don't want to jump no, no, the line. No, 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 no. I don't want to <laughs> jump the line. Okay. No, you're good. Well, <clears throat> to speak on um, the last subject, uh, taxation. In terms of taxation, um, there's next to no like official oversight right into how uh, money is allocated as far as tax dollars are concerned so it'd be nice to see some kind of like oversight for what they use you know the the whole pork debate you know how they fill bills with x y and z for all of these projects i guess the only um current oversight to taxation at this point would be voting right you know so if they're mishandling or, or abusing funds which are our funds right um then they should be voted out but a lot of people don't even ex exercise that so i would probably be up for uh, an additional oversight like a uh, um some independent kind of committee for that if we're if we're going to talk about um what what we wish and and just to just to um go on another point um uh culture as a whole right what they're i think what they're doing is um just infant infiltrating pop culture because pop culture by its nature is accessible to everybody so they uh, invade those avenues first and um, sort of test out what they're going to do or what they should do or how uh, they want society overall to, to sway one way or another. So they inseminate these little uh, ideas into the pop culture zeitgeist, test it out, right? Because if something goes a little bit too extreme, right, they know they have to pull back and, oh, okay, we can't do this, we can't do that, or maybe we have to reframe our messaging, you know, um, a la ta Coates and Jordan Peterson as uh, the Red Skull, right, in, in comics, since um, the previous speaker was speaking on comics and such. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, you know, that's the, uh, was it the phrase that, Politics, politics is downstream from culture. Um, yeah. There is a purposeful, um, it, purposeful nature to go into every cultural institution and make it what we call woke, but basically to put in a, you know, it, it's a cultural Marxist revolution that's basically yeah. happening. We just don't really call it. We give it a, a name like being woke mm -hmm. and like, oh, these people, you know, they're virtue signaling, but mm -hmm. In reality, the people who are behind it know exactly what they're doing. Um, mm -hmm. They want to affect culture, which ultimately will affect how we view the role of government. Um, and so if we can have, let's say, I know we, 
we probably use it to death, but if we were to use uh, Black Lives Matter, for example, and if we were to say that institutionally um, the police are racist or institutionally they are uh, killing us, so on, so on and so forth, they are agents of the state is ultimately mm -hmm. what it comes down to. And what do they want to do? They want to defund them. They want to defund the state. They want to demoralize uh, the police force. And depending mm -hmm. on where it's at, uh, objectively, they probably want it everywhere if they were to have it their way. And uh, I, I think I said this earlier today, but what people misunderstand when it comes to Marxists, they don't hate the police. They just don't like those police. They want their own form of police. Right, because the conversation yeah, yeah. went from uh, defund the police to, uh, well, we just want to reinvest. Uh, we mm -hmm. want to change where those funds go. Which is so close to re-educate, you know? Exactly, exactly. So um, a, a, lot of, a lot of what's happening as far as the changes in culture, the, the long game is to have us change how we view the government. Um, so, you know, I'm a pretty optimistic person. I think that ultimately, um, I think ultimately what will happen is America is going to have some bumps, bruises, and cuts, but I think we will survive. Um, you know, we ha we've had basically the Cultural Revolution during the mm -hmm. 60s, you know, where there were literally people, there were communists, like openly communists yeah. <laughs> who, yeah. were, who were running around and, uh, you know, trying to form communist parties and things of that nature, mm -hmm. uh, even before the 60s. I think it was in the 50s. Um, so, well, this this allure of the uh, utopian society yeah. and um, they sell this idealism um, as if we were all naive. Right. You know, oh, well you know, things shouldn't be the way they are because X, Y, and Z people should be behaving or respecting. And, you know, once they, they start talking about how people should behave, that's when we should start getting worried, right? <laughs> Pretty <laughs> much. Because, and, and it's like, oh, um, uh, this, this guy's, uh, this training, th this um, re-education and guys of, of, of training, people like teaching people how to think it's uh, they've been very subtle right mm -hmm. with all of that obviously they they should be right because you don't want to blatantly say well we just want to re-educate the populace into thinking very specific things on how uh we should behave in public and they, it's always under the guise of, well, you know, we need to make it better. Wouldn't it be nice, you know, if people were just uh, respected everybody's X, Y, or Z, you know, their po position, their stance, their their way of viewing the public in general. And it's, um, it's, they're, <laughs> the subtlety that they're engaging in is not i mean they don't i i don't think that they're successful mm -hmm. right uh in in engaging in the subtlety but they are pushing for something that eventually is going to go that way it's just and then when you call them out for it it's like oh no we didn't say that uh, what are you talking about you know you're crazy conspiracy right right they they rail against this this conspiratory way of of um framing what they're trying to do and it's just uh ridiculous which is which is how they're they're treating um the COVID thing right on the original topic <clears throat> because um when you express a uh, certain um reservations you may have with how they're handling um either the mandate or aspects of of um getting the populace to a place where we're more uh uh it's interacting safely with with everyone they they use this this whole safety feature um when they are when they're doing that um they're they're oh god i'm losing my train of thought here sorry <laughs> um, 
Because it, it gets, well, everything gets lost in the weeds, right? Um, because everything ties everything else. But but in, in any case, what they're what they're doing is um they're they're using your your fear, your natural fear, right? Of just the other, and then they start lumping you into these categories of anti vaxxers just because you show a concern with how they're handling this or that, they lump you with the anti vaxxers, and that effectively is a way of trying to neuter the conversation, right? Neuter the, the person speaking or voicing their concerns about um, public health, you know, and how they're managing public health, and it's right. disconcerting at best, you know. And yeah. then they they just turn around and go, well, you're just an anti-vaxxer. They lump you in with the, with these groups, and they can because as long as they label you right, you're easier to manage. Oh, well, he's a nut, you know. Oh, well, he's obviously a conservative, or oh, and you know that's akin to being evil, right? Right, right. It's a it's a it's a form of demonization, right? Um, yeah, yeah. It's the I Jewish think... star, you know, the little armband they used to put on, you know. Yeah. Um, actually, I want to bring uh, a great name, Little Bundle of Death in. Um, you can unmute yourself. Wow, what an honor. Hi. <laughs> How you doing? Good. So I just wanted to bring in kind of a different perspective. Sure. It's, uh, it's along the same topic, but I think... It kind of goes back to, so a little bit of my background, I work at um, my local prosecutor's office for the county, and I remember before I started working at the prosecutor's office, I had all these ideas about what the prosecutor's office could and could not do, whether that be, oh, well, they have all this discretion, and they have all this power, and then I get in there, I get in there, and lo and behold... Was I surprised at how many <laughs> things that that are totally out of our control? Like, for example, um, talk about a crazy case. There is it, it has a it has a point, I promise. But there is a case where there was a felonious assault case, and nobody wanted to prosecute this because it was stupid. It was basically a drunken bar fight that resulted in a man having having his tooth removed. But because his tooth was a permanent injury, it rose to the level of a felonious assault. Now, technically speaking, prosecutors' offices have what's called prosecutorial discretion. But in reality, what that really does mean is that whenever a prosecutor uses that, they get constant criticism about it like well why did you give it to this guy and not to this person so basically how my friend and mentor explained to me she said that you never get accused of prosecutorial misconduct if you just charge the case based on the facts of the case <laughs> period no no mitigating factors no no nothing and so I was kind of shocked by the fact that we don't control sentences. We don't control all the, all these um, things that we don't control. And so I guess when, in terms of what, how this relates to the government, I think before we decide what role government should have in our lives, we should actually understand the roles that government has now, you know, um, because, and whether or not these things are actually feasible. Like right now, I hate to use equity as a big push, but right now there's a big equity push for um, the prosec prosecutors all across the country to promote equality. And I'll be honest with you, we don't really care. I, I mean, I haven't run into a single prosecutor who cares what the, what the defendant looks like. We, we don't care. All we care about is what is your prior criminal history? What, what exactly did you do? It, that, those are really, how old are you? That's kind of a big one too. 
because obviously like there's some discretion there when it comes to juveniles. But um, so I think sometimes how this COVID panic got fed into so much is that we just kept expecting more and more and more for our government, like fix this problem, fix that problem, fix this issue. And without really realizing that the government's kind of bad at the jobs that they already have (laughs) to do. You know, they're already bad. We're already imperfect at what we do. Um, so to add more jobs to our different government facilities, I, I just think is is totally asinine because they can't even do what they're supposed to do now, let alone adding more jobs. So that's what I got. Okay. And and I would I would agree with you that um they're not very good at their jobs. And in some ways, I kind of think that's that's a little bit of the purpose. Um, I think the purpose within within our governmental system is to have forms of gridlock. You know, we have layers and layers of government so that things can't fly through um, unabashed. Um, so when people try and say, "Well, in China, they just they just did this. They wanted this, and they just did it." Yeah, they can do that. They're authoritarians. Um, they right. can. They can make a a judgment move, and a month later, that's what they're doing moving forward. We don't have that for a reason, because that prevents horrible things to go through. Um, And then it it also prevents our society from constantly switching from one extreme to another, right? So even even if, let's say, every other election cycle, we go from Democrat to Republican, that doesn't mean that our, fundamentally our whole society changes because we switch parties. Maybe, uh, you know, for four years, there may be a couple of policies that go through on the Republican side, less likely because they would do nothing party at this point, but right. uh, maybe on the Democratic side, they pass a couple things and, and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, there's, I think there, there is built-in gridlock in our system. And the more I think about it, the more I appreciate that um, oh, absolutely. I I, yeah. I totally appreciate the gridlock. But I'm just trying to say that um, more control isn't always better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I, I mean, nobody would want, for example, a prosecutor who could just charge however they want because they didn't like you. You know, nobody would want to live in a judicial system like that. So I think I think we, we I think when it comes to government, we have to accept the limitations along with the beauty in those limitations too, because there's things obviously that are really bad that can happen without those limitations, but there's also good things that can't happen because of those limitations. So we have to take the good with the bad. Exactly. I agree with you. Um, Thank you for, for adding to the conversation. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. No problem. Um, Jeff, I'm going to, I'll take you real quick. I know you've been waiting a little bit to speak again here. Topic and to, um, to build off what the last speaker was saying um, and the role of government. Um, it doesn't matter how small of a government you start with, you end up here, um, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Um, I personally am, in the mm-hmm. literal sense of the word, an anarchist in that it's the, the absence of government. Uh, Mr. Kent earlier had said we need to learn to govern ourselves, and that is true. Um, I think he is a little optimistic on um, government in general, but um, we need to learn to govern ourselves because, you know, we started off small with the Articles of Confederation and here we are. Um, and, and, and that's really what needs to happen. We need to, and, and again, I mean, this, this, this whole thing we're doing right now is um, an, an anarcho- uh, set up right there's there's nobody telling you who to call on next and who has to listen and who doesn't have to listen we're doing this in the absence of government 
individuals can run their lives. And in fact, most of their lives are run in the absence of government. Um, I think we just, unfortunately, the government run schools, surprise, surprise, don't teach you about that. Don't tell you that that's an option, that we can interact with each other in a peaceful, cooperative, mutually beneficial way. Yeah, you're right. Um, you know, I have a lot of questions. Uh, I have friends who are, um, you know, anarchists, um, or not a lot, of, but I've, I've met some people who are anarchists, and I've had questions for them as to how it would hypothetically work. I think, I think for me, one of the things that, that comes down to, um, you know, the, the anarchist perspective, and Jeff, thank you for, I'm going to remove your speaker, but thank you, Jeff, for, for jumping in. Um, I think one of my issues when it comes to the whole anarchy vibe is we assume that the only bad way of holding power is through government, right? But government is filled with people, right? So you remove government, those same type of people still exist, right? So even if we, you know, I've heard the people say we should have private police forces. All right, well, um, who's to say that uh, those, in one state, there's 10 private police forces, right? And who's to say that uh, one police force makes enough money to buy four of them? Now we have less, right? We have this happen all the time today. We have corporate conglomerates that buy each other, banks that buy each other, uh, to, to, um, telecommunication companies, uh, big tech companies buy each other, and they become, in a sense, another form of a government within itself. In some ways, Twitter is its own governing body, right? That is extremely powerful, and in some ways, more powerful than the government in regards to speech. So, you know, I guess my issue is the complete switch from having government to only private, uh, the private aspect is an absence of human nature to gravitate towards power, right? So we can have absence of government. Yes, I have issues with government too, um, but I understand the reality is just that even if we, replace government with privatization. We see what's happening now with privatization where private companies are overstepping and don't care about body autonomy, right? Because this is what they want. And imagine if there was no check from any sort of government institution, there was no constitution, you know, things of, the, things of that nature. So, you know, I, I, hear, I hear what people are saying. I think in general, we need to have a better viewpoint of how we manage ourselves, less reliance on other people to take care of us, including the government. Um, but I have I have questions. Not saying that I'm right. I just have questions. That's all. I'm a I'm a curious person. Um, Heather, I'm going to add you as a speaker. You can unmute yourself, Heather. Hi, can you hear me? I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, no I problem. just wanted to go back to, I think, um, I guess, Gabe, I think it was Gabriel said earlier about having more transparency and the government spending. Uh, basically, I just, I kind of feel like the, the taxation and, and the, just the increase in the size of government and their spending, it's almost like a, a Ponzi scheme. You know, we don't, you know, you look at Afghanistan and the military industrial complex, and I, I know this is talked about a lot, but it's really just a way of the government to consolidate power and, you know, just take more money from its constituents without providing uh, the real necessities or the obligations that a government should. But really, all in all, what we're witnessing is, or to me, in my opinion, is I go back to the uh, Oh, um, I think she's having connection issues. 
Um, let's see what happens. Heather, are you, you there? All right, while we're waiting for Heather to come back, I'll bring Gabriel back on here. All right, you can unmute yourself, Gabriel. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so when we were when we were talking about um, government and it's you know the, you're you're spot on with the argument that um, what is the difference between the people of uh, our current government establishment and the difference between the people of who will potentially if you know if uh, Jeff. Um, if I'm understanding Jeff correctly, what well, was the difference between ourselves? I mean, n nothing really, right? Because ultimately, everyone is susceptible to corruption. Like the example that you set before, we, uh, corporations. What what's gonna prevent a corporation from coming in and uh, corrupting a private citizen to sort of nudge? Um. What, what we're trying to do effectively, right? To, 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 to govern or to, to mandate a certain aspect. I mean, all of those problems will arise no matter what kind of iteration, of whether it's private or, or public, right? Our government system. It, it, all of those problems are still there. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And um, the... Other thing that we were talking about, um, God, I was I was trying to think about the legal, right? We were talking about, um, um, God, what was Donna saying about uh, prosecutorial? Sorry, sorry, but well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they only have so much leeway. They only had so much what? Sorry, uh, they only have so much leeway, so much discretion. When it comes to charging people, oh yeah, their their discretion, right? Uh, whether or not they're they're um, allow, oh, uh, that it not considered prosecutorial misconduct if they just stuck to the facts. Well, the problem with that is that um, the incentives in the system, right? Uh, because, you know, everyone's looking to get a leg up. You know, prosecutors eventually want to become judges, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> because those incentives are in place, there will always be a nudge or a push to do something untoward, right? That will, um, you know, for example, DA that we saw with, with the... Um, the Kyle Rittenhouse, right? I mean, it was his moment to shine, and right. and uh, he st he stood in the way of his own ambition, right? So everything that that he tried to do to get this national case to to go his way is uh, based on the incentives in the system which those incentives will exist everywhere in government, whether it's private or not, right? Because... Right. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. So, yeah, it's it's just... Uh, I don't know. The, the, the issue is... Um, oh, oh, okay, now I know what I wanted to talk about. There was... Um, we were talking about before about... Um, crisis management right we were talking about um oh mishandling or handling unfortunately the problem with mishandling or handling a situation um for example the covid crisis is the fact that the only way to be good at it right is to be in trouble constantly right so a lot of people sure. can mismanage these crises because they're unforeseen, right? Um, because if you have a lot of experience in being in deep doo-doo, right, 
then you're kind of ushered out. You're like, oh, there have been too many problems with your tenure in this institution. So we, we'd like to see somebody else handling it. When unfortunately, um, uh, there's no engagement of the subtlety of that, that um, when you, um, like like in my family, my, my family uh, is typical Latino family, right? Um, everything minor is a crisis. Everything major is handled with, with uh, temerity, right? So they can make a mountain out of molehill, but when it came to the real crisis, is everybody was calm. So it's usually why I have a really such a calm demeanor during um, things that high stress level, you know, positions and situations. Right? I, I used to work for the government. Um, I'm a vet, so stress is a thing that <laughs> that's managed in a very specific way through experience and unfortunately when <clears throat> the problem is if you have too much experience in being in trouble then they decide that you are the source of the problem and sort of usher you out you know you've had your time let's let's see what Waldo or Felipe or whoever right whoever the next person is how they handle it and then if that person is fresh faced right and bright eyed and bushy tailed there there has to handle uh the new stress the new issue the new covid crisis or whatever and and uh, ask to perform admirably and it's it's a lot to ask no you're right uh i will agree with you there um gabriel once again thank you for for adding to the conversation just to, re to respond to what you were saying i understand and you actually make a very fair point if there if they were good at handling crises, that means that there's a lot of crises um, that are that are going on. Um, but my issue is when there is a complete fumble, they're unwilling to admit that they fumbled. Um, and what happens, like I, I'll use San Francisco for example. Clearly, San Francisco is in a lot of shit. They're completely mismanaged, um, and they've instituted policies that are failing. They're obviously failing, um, but what do they do? Well, they just make another department, right? <laughs> they just add on top of it. Uh, they add Band-Aid here, Band-Aid there. You know, they have a, a department that picks up shit, literally. Um, that should not exist, but they're unwilling to admit that their, their crisis that's at hand and the way they're trying to manage it or fix it uh, is not working and they're unwilling to reverse what they put in the first place and, and try and start over, or at least go to what is known to work. Um, so my issue a lot of times when it comes to politicians um, is that they're unwilling to admit their fault and they're unwilling to go back on what they're trying to, or what they instituted because they don't wanna, they don't wanna appear wrong. Um, and I, in some ways I understand it, because if they admit that they're wrong, then their opponents use that against them, so on and so forth. But I, I think that's that's one of the issues with with being in a government position. You always have someone who is waiting to, to feed off of your mistakes. And you have people who are extremely driven, extremely egotistical, uh, think everything is about them, and want to dictate to people how to run their life. Um, so that those are just some of my issues when it comes to the politicians and government. Um, I think we're, we come to a point where to wrap it up, but um, my last words are that despite all the things that we were talking about here, um, I am optimistic. Uh, I've talked to people from other countries who have said, if America falls, we're screwed. <laughs> and, and I actually, I believe what they're saying. Um, years ago, I kind of had like this bright eyed look, even about like the, the rest of the Western world, like, oh, these other places are just like America, just a little bit different. But under this particular crisis, um, I am seeing things that are visibly different here than in other places. You know, my life has been relatively normal throughout this entire process. I've been going to work every single day in the office every single day 
throughout the entire pandemic. And there are people I know, let's say in Germany, who can't go anywhere, who at one point could not go out on the street. And I know that was not happening here. Um, I know at one point, maybe in New York City, where uh, Mr. Uh, Communist uh, Bill was, was having the police force try to crack down on people hanging out outside for a little bit, but that failed utterly in a, in a city filled with millions of people. But there are places, even in Western Europe, who are supposed to be just like America, just as free, um, completely overstep the boundaries that we would have in this particular country. So uh, one thing this pandemic has showed me is that we are lucky to live here. Even our neighbors to the north um, have less rights than we do. And this pandemic is also showing what they're experiencing, what they're being forced to do, what they're being forced to comply with. Um, and there are some people within this country who want something similar, but the fact that it is such a hurdle for them to do that gives me hope that the authoritarian side of our country that does exist, because we're a very diverse country, uh, is failing. You know, Biden wants OSHA to mandate employers with, a, I think it's over 100 employees, to all have the vaccine. And if not, go under some sort of special circumstances, completely inconvenience. But basically, they're trying to inconvenience uh, employees to get the vaccine, even if they don't want it. Um, to me, that's overstepping the boundaries. And the fact that it's being held up in court gives me hope that all our different checks and balances are, are really getting stressed out. Um, uh, maybe stressed out is the wrong word, but they're really getting used throughout this entire process, uh, throughout this entire pandemic. And so uh, I, for the people who are listening, I know we're, we're talking about the overstepping the boundaries of the government, but I am optimistic that once things start to die down, which I am hopeful for, um, you know, right now is different than a year ago for a variety of reasons. But once things start to die down and the smoke clears, I think that America will still be intact. The woke are not going to win um, because nobody really likes them. Uh, their their t attacks and slurs and p calling everybody Nazis. Um, it's the it's like the boy who cried wolf. No no one no one believes them anymore, right? So um, the insults don't work anymore. We're not all white supremacists. That you know, all of these things, all of these tactics coming from extremists within our country, uh, coming from people who are falling in love with authoritarian measures and com and full compliance with the government just cause. All those things, in my personal view, will start to fail. Um, so I am optimistic. I hope you guys are a little bit optimistic. Maybe I gave you some reason to be optimistic, but I want to thank everybody for, for listening on this conversation. Uh, every week, we're talking about different topics. Uh, so next week, join us, uh, Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, and um, you guys can join in the conversation if you want to. Uh, but Thank you for coming to a good faith space where we have good faith conversations with people of different viewpoints and uh, backgrounds. And I, I uh, always have different different guests. So next week will be different people and uh, you'll see advertisements. If you follow me on Twitter, I'll put up uh, advertisements uh, so you can see who's gonna be there and what the topic will be about. So uh, thank you everybody. Have a wonderful night and God bless.